Welcome to the Next Level Human Podcast. As a human, you have a job to do. In fact, you have four jobs. To earn and manage money, to attain and maintain health and fitness, to build and sustain personal relationships, to find meaning and make a difference. None of these jobs are taught in school. And that is what this podcast is designed to do. To educate us all on living our most fulfilled lives through the mastery of these four jobs. I'm your host, Dr. Jay Tita, and I believe we are here living this life for three reasons and three reasons only. To learn, to teach, and to love. In this podcast, I will be learning, teaching, and loving right along with you. I'm grateful to have your company. Here's to our next level. Welcome to the show, everybody. Today, we're going to be talking about the concept or the idea, um, a discussion around emotions um, and particularly the discussion around uh, what would probably most aptly be described as emotional freedom. And this is talked about a lot in many different philosophies. Most of you who listen to this podcast know that I am uh, sort of a deep sort of dive studier of Stoicism and Taoism. And both of these are sort of my natural, um, uh, the, the natural philosophical tools that I take when having um, discussions about useful ways of approaching the world. And so um, over the last couple of weeks, actually, I've had uh, friends and I myself have been involved in issues that I think really, um, really sort of, uh, you know, have their focus, their locale at this level of emotional freedom. And so I wanted to do this uh, um, because of this, because it's fresh on my mind, because of some of my experiences of late, and also because um Two friends in particular uh, have been having issues in this regard. And usually with this podcast, I don't necessarily plan these episodes, but life just sort of comes along and gives you discussion points. And so I think this is going to be hopefully useful for many people because the things that we deal with in life are always about um, a collision of us with other people and how we deal with other people. And what drives, I think, the way that we deal with other people is our emotional responses. And of course, our emotional responses have an awful lot to do with our emotional past. And so we've talked before in sort of the next level human construct that we humans live into stories, rules, boxes, ideas, we essentially grow up and respond to our environment. And between the ages of one and 10 years old, lots of what we are doing is formulating our beliefs, our stories, um, beliefs about the world, the rules in which we live and how to behave. And we're also, um, as part of these stories and ways of behaving and all this kind of stuff, we, we oftentimes develop certain ways of emotional emotionally being. And because of this, we oftentimes can get trapped in these states of um, emotions. So as an example, I'll talk about one of my friends who um, was discussing to me, we had a very long discussion about an argument um, that he had with his brother, where the two of them had something going on. They got into a discussion. My friend lost his temper, which he regrets and sort of said some things. And it spiraled into this very bad argument. And one of the things that he was saying to me is he's like, man, can you help me understand why after all this time, even though I've gotten better, I still can default into this negative emotional place. And I think this is critical to understand because to me, this is what emotional freedom is all about. To be emotionally free, by definition, means you're not emotionally triggered, right? It's not freedom to be walking out in the world, have something happen to you and for you to fall back in old emotional habits, stories, 
rules, ways of behaving. So I have done a past episode and the actual episode numbers uh, escaping me at this time, but it was on emotional maturity, all about sort of discussing uh, emotions in this regard. And I'll do a little bit of review on those concepts here briefly so we could talk about emotional freedom. But um, I do think that particular episode on emotional maturity would be useful for those of you who like this discussion and find it useful. I do want this to be a discussion, hopefully, that gives you tools to use in your life when you're dealing with people. So first of all, let's talk a little bit about um, emotions. How should we be looking at these things? In my way of looking at this and my study of psychology and philosophy, I tend to see emotions very differently than most people. So what I'm about to say may trigger you in a sense, and that's just fine, right? We've talked about this before on this podcast that part of being a next level human is sitting in comfort uh, with different ideas. In fact, one really good way to measure your emotional maturity has to do with the uh the ability to sit with someone who sees life differently than you and who disagrees with you. Um, The most psychologically immature of us are triggered by people disagreeing with us. We literally will get mad, angry, frustrated, overwhelmed, have outbursts, feel egotistical, feel arrogant, have insecurity when people disagree with us. An emotionally secure mind sees disagreements as interesting, not threatening. An emotionally immature mind sees differences as threatening and therefore will uh, amount um, a, uh, you know, an emotional uh, support around that, right? So we have this idea that sometimes we use emotions to shield us or distract us or, um, you know, deflect. In this way, I see emotions as um, different than a lot of people. A lot of people will see emotions as sort of the heart, right? And you get into this head and this heart argument. Oh, you should listen to your heart. You should listen to your emotions. They are um, the, the way to go. We even hear this in our language. Follow your heart. If your heart feels it, then you should follow it. And the truth of the matter is, when you really get into this, um, what ends up happening more times than not? And by the way, um, I have arrived at this because I used to think very similar. But if you look at uh, psychology research, if you look at just honestly take a look at life in general, emotionally coming at things without having logic is uh, almost always steers us in a wrong direction. Now, we could argue the other way as well, right? Being logically only logical with no emotion can also get us in trouble. Um, What I think people are usually saying when they say follow your heart is they're more saying follow your intuition. And people tend to see intuition as an emotional thing. Intuition is not an emotional thing. Intuition is a logical and, and an emotional thing. In other words, intuition is uh, a sense uh, perception, uh, and an experience, uh, of information that have been gathered over time that integrates into this sixth sense of knowing. I know this is good for me because it's using logic and feeling and experience. That's basically what intuition is. Intuition is not magic. It's not following your heart. It's actually following your head and your heart drawing on vast amounts of experience. This is one of the reasons why you can have no intuition in a space that you have no experience in. For example, pilots can have intuition around flying and their intuition gets better the more flying they've done. Uh, You know, so the more they've been up in the air and the more hours they have accumulated. And so when we talk about the emotional side of intuition and sort of emotional freedom, we have to understand that emotions by themselves oftentimes steer us in the wrong way. And they oftentimes are elicited or come about based on wrong stories or inappropriate defense mechanisms. And so the way I see emotions is they're kind of like road signs. They're kind of like the road sign sitting in front of you, pointing you in particular directions. 
Now, if you can imagine a road sign that is constantly telling you to turn left here, turn left here, right? Where it's like you get directions and you're like, turn left on Brook Street, go down a little bit and turn left on Brook Street and go down a little bit more and turn left on Brook Street, which would be similar to being like every time you approach something uh, that looks like this, be angry, make a left turn, right? And so what ends up happening, this is very much what people do. Now, these emotional states, if they are, if you are emotionally mature and you are, um, you know, sort of not being hijacked by your emotions, every time you feel an emotion, you can kind of say, what direction is this sending me in? You can then logically try to evaluate why you're feeling this way and it allows you to unpack a lot of things. In other words, I see emotions in life as teaching mechanisms. Anytime you have a recurrent emotion or repeated patterns in your life, the same emotion comes up and then especially when it causes the same issues, what ultimately this means to me is that you are somebody who continues to live exclusively from your heart and does not integrate your head into this and it's getting you in trouble. This is like getting into a roundabout on a back street, just staying in that circle. Go left, go left, go left, go left. And you're just going in circles and things start to repeat themselves. So to me, emotions give you an idea of where you are, right? Logic helps you sort of decipher this in a sense and goes, do I want to be where I am? Is where I am useful to me? So in a very real sense, when we look at psychology, some people would describe it as life is simply about moving towards pleasure and avoiding pain, right? This is basically what it's about. And in this process of avoiding pain and getting to pleasure, we oftentimes inadvertently run into pain. And this teaches us about how to integrate that pain and become better. And then we learn. And as we learn, we develop more intuition. And as we develop more intuition, we learn to integrate our emotions with our thought processes, with our brain, with our logic. And so to me, being emotionally free is synonymous with, with not getting caught in these emotionally, emotional triggers. So you might say, well, Jade, how in the hell do I do that? Well, the idea here is that you first have to look at, in my mind, the concept of assumptions and expectations. Think about it for a second. When we think about the fact that we live stories, over and over again, and we live patterns over and over again, and these stories and these patterns have familiar plots, and these plots have familiar emotions, you can kind of think that what is behind this is an assumption. There is an expectation always there. So from my perspective, we start this concept off by essentially going, if I want to be emotionally free, and use my emotions as simply to check in and as a way to give richness to logic and a way to be more intuitive with myself, then I want to look at the assumptions and the expectations that I'm making, which by the way, these are again, just synonyms for stories, right? So instead of saying, living these stories, I'm saying what you're doing is you're making assumptions and you're having expectations. So in my mind, I, I basically have four rules that I use around this that I see as the four keys to emotional freedom. And so let's go through these. The first one in my mind is as a rule, do not make assumptions about what other people should do. As you collide with other humans, most of what are going to elicit negative emotions from us are the things that we assume people will do or should do that they don't necessarily do, right? So in this particular case with my friend, um, you know, he's assuming perhaps that there's a shared story that him and his brother have, or he's assuming perhaps that his way of seeing the world is his brother's way of seeing the world. Or he's making an assumption that he should be able to say certain things to his brother and have his brother respond a certain way. 
or he's assuming that the brother picks up the tab or he's assuming that the brother will always say nice things or he's assuming that the brother has his back, right? And partly what we're assuming is that we're the center of the universe, that no one else has anything else going on in the world, right? That don't we do this oftentimes, especially in romantic situations, right? Let's say you're interested in someone romantically and they have said that they are going to call you and let's say they don't or they call late. Your assumption oftentimes might be, well, they just aren't thinking about me and they're purposely not calling me or they're not thinking about me. When perhaps another assumption or a better assumption would be that they've got a life just like you and maybe they're just caught up in that life. And perhaps that when they are living their life, they're not as good with some of the things you might be good with. Maybe they're really good with plans and like to have a structured, defined way of uh, what they're going to be doing hour to hour and day to day. And perhaps you aren't. Perhaps you like, you know, to make game time decisions and that's your natural way of doing things. And so if you assume that you're the center of the universe and you assume that people are going to, you know, naturally um, be OK without definitive defined plans and then they react emotionally to you not having those definitive defined plans and then you are triggered by that, you can see that this is essentially getting caught in this emotional loop. And so if instead you have no assumptions around how people should be, especially in the beginning as you're getting to know someone, you can begin to vet them. And more importantly, you don't have to get emotionally wrapped up in this. So having assumptions for other people in the way that they show up in the world is one way that we get emotionally hijacked. So we cannot, if we want to be emotionally free in my mind, make assumptions. Now, of course, the first thing that comes out of this is, Jade, how is that possible that we don't make assumptions? Aren't assumptions um, a reasonable way of approaching the world? Like, for example, if someone tells you they're going to call you, shouldn't I assume that they are going to value that, um, you know, sort of word that they've given me. They've given me my word. I'm going to call you. I should be able to assume, shouldn't I be able to count on them? And I would say 100% no, you shouldn't. You should not assume that that's going to happen. Any number of things, you should assume life does what life does. Any number of things could keep them from calling you. One of which is yes, um, you uh, them perhaps not considering you. But there's still any number of reasons for that. Now, over time, as you continue to see someone's behavior, in my mind, you, sh you still shouldn't make assumptions about what they should do. You, the only real assumption that I ever think is a good one is just to assume people will do whatever it is that they do. It's another way of saying to assume that life will happen. And what is life? Life is by definition change and challenge. That is what life is, change and challenge. So what can I assume about other people? That they will do exactly what they will do. They will, they, that they are unpredictable, that they are um, individuals who have lives, who work in a different way than I do, right? And so this is one of the first ways to do this. So you might say, well, Jay, then how do we um, ever get anything done then if we don't have these assumptions? And I admit it's very difficult to do, but this gets into the second rule. So the second rule would be not only should you not have assumptions for what others should do, right? It's about should, but rather just assume they're going to do whatever they do do. And I just have to watch and wait for them to do that. But also don't have any expectations about what they will do either. And this is seems very similar, but it's slightly different. And really, there's a there's a second corollary that goes along with this. It's it's about having only expectations for yourself. So maybe we can say rule one is don't make assumptions about what others should do and only have expectations for how you will behave, not how others will behave. This to me, this this one two punch here 
is very critical. And I'll explain how this works. So for me, I go in relationships with friends, romance, co-workers across the board. My practice, and I'm not always perfect because I'm human, but my practice is I will not have assumptions for what you should do about how you should call me at a particular time, how we should make plans a particular number of days in advance, how we should, how you should show up, how you should dress at a restaurant or whatever it is. I'm not going to have those assumptions. However, I do have my standards as a human about what I would like and how I would like to be treated. So in other words, I'm not going to assume that you rise to my sense of how it should be, but I am going to have standards by which I uh, interact with people. So while I won't have expectations or assumptions for you, I will very clearly have expectations for myself. So for example, um, my expectations might be that my standard is you show up on time, um, that I do not like uh, other people not to show up on time. And my expectation for myself is that I show up on time. So my expectation is I'm not assuming they will show up on time. I'm not expecting they will show up on time, but it is my desire and what I would like and what I feel I deserve and how I show up. It's part of just my way of doing things. So my expectation for self is that if someone does not show up on time, I can do something about that. And my expectation will be if someone continues to not show up on time, then my expectation might be that I will expect myself to have a conversation with them. Or I might expect myself to um, adjust my timetable and also start showing up late. Or my expectation might be that I distance myself from this person. Or my standard might be that, hey, this is not someone I can get close to. In other words, none of that is about the other person. All of that is about my expectations and my standards for self. So in other words, I'm not going to spend my time begging, pleading, cajoling, convincing this particular person that they need to show up on time. Instead, I'm going to set certain expectations, certain standards, certain things in place that uh, help me manage this thing that I think is important inside of my life. And so maybe my first expectation is that I will expect to have a conversation with this person. Maybe that conversation is about, listen, I know we're all different and everything else, but it really hurts me when someone doesn't show up on time. It makes me feel devalued. It makes me feel X, Y, Z, right? Now, what happens there is because I'm putting it back on me, there's no reason for me to be mad. There's no reason for me to be anxious. There's no reason for me to have any of these things because I've already made up my decision about how I expect to behave because I can control that behavior. I cannot control their behavior. And I've always said this about emotions, anxiety and all of its manifestations, uh, you know, anxious sadness, anxious anger, anxiety, pure anxiety, all of this kind of stuff. Anxiety is really almost always about the inability to make a choice. And one of the primary ways that will keep you from making a choice is allow the other person to be the one who's making the choice. So for in other words, if you're somebody who's always about plans, 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 and this person isn't, they're more like, let's fly by the seat of my pants, then you, if you put the expectation on them and the assumption on them, they're going to keep you guessing all the time, which is going to, in, to increase your anxiety, which is going to take away your emotional freedom, right? And maybe that gets you angry or sad in response. And so there's this downhill emotional spiral. But if instead you go, I'm not letting them dictate, right? My expectation is if this is a person who comes across this way over and over again, I'm going to communicate to them, see if they will accommodate me and then make my decisions about whether I want to be around them um, or not. I'm sorry to break into the show, but I wanted to take a second to cover one of our sponsors and tell you all about Paleo Valley at paleovalley.com. 
These are the grass-fed sticks that I tell you all so much about that all of my friends know I have on hand constantly. They are in my car. They are at my house. I keep them at my sister's home and my parents' house. I have these things everywhere because they are the simplest, most convenient whole foods protein supplement you can get. Almost like carrying around pure protein, low-carb protein in your pocket. They also, these Paleo Valley beef sticks, are the only the only 100% grass-fed and grass-finished beef sticks on the market. They use organic spices. They are naturally fermented instead of using nitrates and nitrites that can be a problem in some of these cured meats, and they simply taste fantastic. Check out the original or the jalapeno. Those are my favorites. Please make sure you go over to paleovalley.com and visit when checking out, use the code NEXT LEVEL for a 15% discount. Remember, our sponsors keep the show going by you giving them your patronage and spending your money on these high quality products. You actually do a few things. One, you're helping to support the podcast. And two, you are helping your health. And three, you are making sure that good quality companies like Paleo Valley can be out there doing their business, changing the world, making the earth better. One of the things you may not know about this is that grass-fed organic and grass-finished beef is doing something that is so utterly important for our environment, actually helping to repopulate the topsoil. A lot of people don't know this, but our topsoil is being extremely depleted. And raising animals, especially cattle, the correct way helps to get that topsoil back. This is one of the reasons why I love Paleo Valley. Not to mention it tastes fantastic, but they're one of these companies, like my other sponsors, Cured Nutrition and Organifi, that are doing the right things by the environment. I really appreciate everything they do, and I hope you will check them out. Thanks so much. PaleoValley.com. Use the code next level. And now back to the show. I want to jump in real quick and tell you about one of my favorite new products. And to start out, I want to ask you a question. If you had to follow your friends around who are not the healthiest in the world and see what they are doing, what would be the number one thing you would probably tell them to do to start? For most people, that's going to be drinking more water, right? This is something that we talk about all the time in health and fitness. It's almost as if we think of it as an afterthought now because obviously water is so crucial. However, we oftentimes get this wrong. For example, did you know that when it comes to hydration, just drinking water can make things worse? Most people don't know this. Why? Partly because most people are over drinking water and under consuming the electrolytes that help water do its job. What we don't realize is that hydration is not just about water. It's about electrolytes, the minerals in there, as well as getting that water into the cells. And so you do not want to be over-consuming water if you're not getting your electrolytes right. And this opens up a whole new discussion because most people are not getting their electrolytes right. For example, did you know that low sodium, too low sodium, is an issue? Just as much, if not more so, than high sodium. In other words, what we want if we're going to get the right electrolytes is to get the right amount of sodium and potassium and magnesium in the Goldilocks zone. We don't want too much. We don't want too little. We want it just right. This opens up a whole other thing here, too, because people who are exercising, doing sauna therapies, doing low-carb diets are disrupting and losing lots and lots of their electrolytes. For example, when insulin is not around and low-carb diets, you will excrete lots of sodium. In other words, under that state, exercising, low-carb diets, all these things, you actually need more sodium. And so if you're somebody who has been just drinking water, not paying attention to electrolytes, and also feeling fatigued, feeling like you're underperforming, not sleeping right, getting cramps, twitches, headaches, any of these things, 
then you are probably dealing with an electrolyte issue. This is where the product element comes in. This product has been a game changer for me and many, many of my patients and clients. This is a rehydration electrolyte beverage, basically. It is a powder of electrolytes formulated with 1,000 milligrams of sodium, 200 milligrams of potassium, and 60 milligrams magnesium without the added sugar and other nonsense that comes in beverages like Gatorade. This stuff is basically a rehydration beverage on steroids. It is the thing that is going to replenish your electrolytes in the right ratios, decrease fatigue, really correct chronic dehydration. And by the way, many people are dehydrating themselves, becoming hyponatremic, low sodium, when they're consuming too much water. You need your electrolytes on board, especially if you are someone who is losing lots of sodium and other electrolytes through low-carb diets and lots and lots of exercise. This is where Element comes in. Element is a new sponsor to the Next Level Human podcast. I cannot recommend this product enough. I have been using this stuff for months now, and I have immediately seen changes in my energy levels. I feel like I'm operating on a whole other level, and I have seen this as being the primary thing that people who have been using Element have been telling me that their fatigue is getting better, especially fatigue that comes after very intense workouts that involve lots of sweating and lots of intense output from the nervous system. Please check out Element. Use the code next level, drinkelement.com. That's D R I N K L M N T dot com drinkelement.com and let's get back to the show. And so this is what I mean by not making assumptions and not having expectations for others, but instead always and only having expectations for self, right? I think this is a very important way um, to uh, think about this in my mind, okay? So from my perspective, this is really how you want to be looking at this in the first rule and the second rule of emotional freedom. Now, this flows into what I would call the third rule, and it's a natural flow. In order to not have assum- not make assumptions about what people should do and not have expectations for others, but to only have expectations for yourself, you have to have the conviction to be yourself. And to have the conviction to be yourself, you must know yourself really well. So how do you then know yourself? Well, ironically, we can swing back around to emotions. When you have repeated emotions that are recurrent from one relationship to the next and they end up uh, eliciting the same responses and the same behaviors and you run into the same patterns over and over again, the same familiar anger, the same anxiety, the same sadness, the same overwhelm with one person after the next, then the common denominator is you. And what to me this illustrates is that what you are doing again is your assumptions and expectations are all geared toward the outside world, the outside community. You cannot control the outside world and the outside community. All you can control is how you respond to the outside world and the outside community. And your response should be based on some kind of standard or honor code. So you can see how these rules flow one into the next. So you have to be the conviction to be yourself. Now, why do I use the the idea of conviction here? Because Let's be very clear about this. When you have standards and expectations for self, other people will bump into these standards and expectations, We're just, which is just another word for boundaries, right? So in other words, they will bump into your boundaries. You will set the boundary. They will walk up to the boundary, perhaps cross the boundary. You will then say, that's not cool with me. You crossed my boundary. And then they may turn around and walk away. They may choose not to want to be around you. They may choose not to engage with you. They may think 
that your boundaries are unreasonable, right? And in that case, you may lose that friendship, that relationship, that romance um, in its current form. It may change. You may not have this person in your life. And this scares people, right? And by the way, when you're dealing with narcissistic personalities who love to emotionally hijack you and gaslight you and manipulate your reality, the reason they're able to do that is because you don't have clear convictions and you don't have clear boundaries. So they will pick away. These people are experts at this. They will see that you have not spent the time defining what your standards and convictions are around the way that you should be treated, the, the, around the way you pr uh, prefer to be. And then they will take advantage of that. Now, I ask you, who's really taking advantage of who in this situation? Is it the person who you are repeated, who's repeatedly uh, assaulting your boundaries? Or is it you who is repeatedly allowing your boundaries to be crossed and not definitively being able to walk away yourself. So when I say conviction, it is the need, the ability to say, I don't like this, and to also be sure that whether I lose this person or not, or whether they lose me, I am clear, convicted that this is who I am, this is what I stand for, and this is what I believe. Now, it's important that we understand at this juncture of my boundaries coming up against your boundaries or my reality colliding with your reality, this is where we get to learn. So I'm not saying very clearly, I hope you don't hear me saying that this conviction isn't necessarily flexible. Sometimes we have boundaries and ways of being that are unreasonable and we only see they're unreasonable because everyone is repelled by us. So there's this give and take here, right? This idea that the outside world and especially outside people teach you a lot about yourself. And so all of us have to integrate self with other. This is what is sort of amazing about things like the Taoist philosophy. All is one in a sense. Taoism and the extension of Taoism, things like Buddhism and things like that are, speak about this all is one thing. And part of what they're talking about here is that you as a human can't really exist without integrating other people. And so when you set boundaries that are too firm or too unreasonable, you will repel everybody. Right. But when you say when you don't set boundaries at all, you will be at the whims of everybody. And so the idea here with emotional freedom is finding this place where you can have your honor code and your convictions and your way of living that naturally um, integrate other people who also have reasonable boundaries and reasonable conviction. And what happens is now, without making assumptions for others, what they should do, having only expectations for yourself, not expectations for others, and being convicted in your beliefs in terms of what your boundaries and standards are, you now are less likely to be reactive and emotionally triggered at all because you are within yourself. So you see how this is sort of the, the perfect merging of the Taoist philosophy with sort of the Stoic philosophy. The fourth aspect of this then is you're, there has to be some courage here, right? Because there's no question about people aren't going to like your standards at times. And some of those people you may like a lot, but they don't like you. And this is some of the most difficult stuff that we can get into because we can lose relationships this way. We can um, end up in a position where people may not like us or may not choose us any longer in these particular ways. And this is the idea of having the courage to be disliked as a human, the courage to be ourselves and not let other people's feelings about us dictate how we bend in the wind, to be stable, to be courageous enough to say, you know what, I'm a human and I hate when someone dislikes me, but I hate more that I would give up what I know is right for me just to be liked. 
This is this idea in my mind of going from the culture level person who's all about popularity and will bend in the wind like a chameleon just to be liked and a next level human who is always integrating other people but is always clear on who they are. And it, it says me being who I am is more important than you liking who I am. And so you need to have the courage to be disliked as well. So all four of these in my mind matter. Number one, don't make assumptions about what others should do. Number two, have expectations only for self, not others. Number three, have the conviction to be who you are. And four, have the courage to be disliked. Now, as you begin to practice these four things, automatically now your emotions are not necessarily triggered by outside events or people outside of your internal psyche. You don't get pulled in all kinds of different directions. Now, to me, this is not just emotional maturity, but this leads to emotional freedom. Now, I do want to say a few other things about emotional freedom. And this has to do with the stoic um, way of looking at control. And so when we look at these four things, we have to keep this in mind constantly that the way the Stoics describe this is the best way that I've ever seen this. The locus of control needs to be considered. So in their mind, they have this idea of there are things that you control completely. There are things that you do not control at all. And there are things that you partly control. Now, part of what having expectations and assumptions are all about is thinking that you have control over other people. Other people you do not control at all. You might think you have partial control or partial influence, and perhaps you do. Perhaps we can say influence is the partial control here. But what the Stoics would say is, of these three things, the things you control completely, the things you control partially, and the things you do not control at all, you should always and only focus on the things you control completely and let everything else go away. Let everything else be icing on the cake, so to speak. And they go even further to say, by the way, what is the only thing that we actually control as humans? Well, the only thing we actually control as humans is our way of seeing something, our internal emotional state. We can choose to see a thing. It's like Marcus Aurelius, the famous Stoic said, if you are wounded and do not see yourself as wounded, then well, you have not been wounded, right? This is the idea behind this. Now imagine being able to go through life like that where someone says something to you um, that is so degrading and racist or horrible in some way about you. And you go, hmm, OK, that's about that person. In other words, the reason it's about them is because you go, I don't see that. I don't take that as wounded. Your friend might just be like, I cannot believe you didn't react to what this person just said to you. And for you, you essentially go, I can't control what they think. All I know is what I think and what I control. And I just I just choose to ignore that. I oftentimes in myself, again, it's a practice, but I, I practice this with both compliments and criticisms. I, my control mechanism, my conviction of being myself is to essentially say what someone thinks about me is none of my business in a sense. It's their business. And when they give me a compliment, I can see that as about me or about them. I almost always try to see it as about them. And when they give me a criticism, I most always try to see it about them as well. And then what I do is I say, by the way, this is about them, but is there anything I can learn here? And if I start hearing this criticism again and again, over and over, or I start hearing the same compliment again and again, over and over, I begin to consider that now. And then I essentially say, hmm, I'm getting this feedback a lot. Is this something that I might want to um, integrate into my conviction, uh, my way of seeing myself? But one criticism or one compliment is not something that I will get overly attached to. That's because I control my mental state. 
I don't, and part of emotional freedom, by the way, it's not just controlling negative emotions. It's also getting a hold of positive emotions that may be um, inadvertent or not very helpful or not necessarily real. We, all, we know people who can get stuck in this where they really attach to the positive emotions and they really attach to the negative emotions. We have a, a thing for this bipolar or, uh, you know, this idea of manic depressive. You know, we see this an awful lot in people who overly attach to either compliments and criticisms, right? People who attach to criticisms either within themselves um, tend to be a little bit more depressed. People who are constantly bouncing back between criticisms and compliments tend to be a little bit more anxious. And so you can kind of see this happening. Now, the things that we can't control would be just outside events. I can't control the person in the other car, what they're going to do. All I can do is control what I'm going to do, right? I can't control what another person thinks. I can't control whether another person likes chocolate or vanilla. The, all those things I have to put away. I also cannot control whether my brother or my girlfriend or my coworker or whoever is going to do things a particular way. They are a unique entity separate from me, um, but also related to me. This all one thing. So they can mirror, they can mirror me. They can provide information to me. I can integrate them, but I also simultaneously have to look at myself. And so what the Stokes would say is if you spend all your time focusing only on what you can control completely, it does allow you to put some energy into things that you don't control fully, but you partially control. So that they would say that the, under these three influences, 90%, 100%, you know, 99% of what you do, most of what you do should be only on what you control completely. This is why I say don't make assumptions and only have expectations for yourself. It's kind of speaking to these locuses of control. But then you'll perhaps when you do this, have some energy left over that allows you to influence other people and to choose to say, you know what, I know I don't have complete control over this, but I have some partial control and I would like to influence this. And this is where you can move into the realm of partial control, realizing that you only and always have only partial control and to understand that you can influence up to your point and then you have to essentially let you go and uh, let it go. And this is where this dovetails into this idea of if you really want emotional freedom and you really want to master these four elements, you have got to become an excellent communicator, which brings up lots of different things that I have discussed before about people who don't have emotional freedom gossip a ton. People who don't have emotional freedom or, or emotional maturity often lie or exaggerate. Right. And people who don't have emotional freedom and emotional maturity oftentimes can't have difficult conversations or it takes them days to have, uh, you know, uh, conversations in the way that they may have been able to have in the moment when the emotions were fresh because they're not getting hijacked by those emotions. And so from my perspective, this is how this sort of comes down in this realm of the things that you only control partly. This is where you learn. This is where you learn to have the conviction to be yourself. You learn all about yourself and, um, you know, finding that balance between being a member of society and being an individual. It's the Goldilocks zone, right? You cannot, we are not islands unto ourselves. We can't just go off and say, I'm going to be alone. I don't want to be with anyone. That is not how we are built as humans, but we are also not built like I'm just going to let everyone do whatever they want and I'll be at their emotional whims. So we have to find this place in the middle, this place where we are uh, solid in our convictions. We know who we are and we are willing to bend our boundaries and adjust our standards based on the feedback we get from the outside world. And this is very, very important because emotions by the way, and the volatility of those emotions are always the things that tell us we still have work uh, to do. And on both sides of this, not only do we not want to stuff emotions, um, but we also don't want to be emotionally washed in a wild ocean of emotions either, right? We don't want that. What we want is the ability to 
feel emotions, but not live emotions. What do I mean by that? It means that I can feel angry, but I'm not going to be angry always. And that's not going to be my natural default. I can feel what sadness feels like and express it to you, but I won't live sadness. When you're living anger or you're living sadness or you're living an emotion, what that means is that you are caught up in this traffic circle of making lefts constantly. You live anger. Anytime something comes up for you that is challenging to you in any way that violates, you know, um, any sort of way of seeing yourself, you just go to anger again and again. You've done it throughout your life or you just go to sadness or whatever it is. This is a key that you are not yet here in this emotional freedom. Now, by the way, it's not a judgment. Certainly I'm not. I wish I could say I was completely emotionally free. All I can say is I'm much more emotionally free now than I ever have been because of these understandings. And I know and can spot when I am being emotionally hijacked. And so this is the way that I would look at this. Now, as part of this discussion, right, and this goes to this last part about the courage to be disliked, because I know people oftentimes say, well, Jade, because I've had this discussion with lots of people, they go, what does this actually look like in the real world? I mean, there's certain people that elicit certain emotions in us that we just can't escape, right? I mean, it's, they're, they're just going to, you know, cause these emotions in us. It's about them, right? They're toxic. They're the ones. And from my perspective, I do not believe in this idea of toxic humans, in a sense. Now, let me be clear about this. There are certainly people who have negative energies and can elicit certain ways of being. But to me, you have choice. This goes back to control. You have choice to avoid these individuals. In other words, what's really toxic is knowing something is toxic and continuing to engage with that toxic substance. I've never understood this. If I knew that my um, home was had mold spores everywhere and I was just like, that home is toxic and it's making me sick, and yet I just keep going back into the house and choosing to live there, then who's the toxic one? The house or me? <laughs> I am actually the one who is choosing to engage in toxicity. So by extension, I am as toxic as my home if I keep exposing myself to it. So if you think someone's toxic and you keep exposing yourself to that toxicity, then you yourself are toxic. And this to me is hugely, hugely important because it's a recognition that I am responsible for my feelings. No one else can make me feel a particular way. And if every time I run into this particular person, I live into this emotion, then that is a pattern about me. And that pattern probably, usually in this case, when we're talking about people who keep, you know, doing negative things to us, normally it's about a pattern of not having standards and boundaries that would keep me from interacting with this person. And of course, this is not always easy, right? Like, so let's say I have an ex and I don't have kids, but let's say I did, and we share a child, and I can't get away from this ex, but this, re this ex is emotionally volatile and emotionally immature and emotionally toxic to me, in a sense, right? Or elicits this. I have to define and say, wait a second, she's not toxic, I'm allowing this. I'm going to have to interact with her in a different way to set down standards. So maybe it's like, I no longer go to her house, I no longer allow her to come to my house. We'll pick the kids up and exchange the kid, you know, at a neutral location or whatever it is. But I have to basically say I'm not establishing standards and ways of behaving. And sometimes within ourselves, it's simply saying I will not talk politics with this particular person. That's a standard. I will not do these particular things with this person. Also, as a part of a standard, I have a rule. And that rule is really a critical one when we talk about especially the conviction to be yourself and the courage to be uh, disliked. And this rule goes like this. And we probably could make this a fourth rule of emotional freedom, but I think it fits in with number three and four. But the rule is never let anyone treat you a way you are not or no longer wish to be. Let me say that again. Never let anyone ever treat you a way you are not or no longer wish to be. If they do, then you need to have the conviction to be yourself and the courage to be disliked. And the solution to that is set up the boundaries and the standards right there. Right. 
right there. Now, what does this look like, by the way? So partly I'll give you a little bit of a background into some of my sort of dysfunctions, perhaps, um, in romance, let's say. So partly what how I come to this, given where I've been in my life, I've always been and I'm in a helping profession. So I'm oftentimes managing people's emotions, um, helping them manage their emotions. And I'm also I'm oftentimes being an emotional conduit, letting their emotions flow through me. But to a big to a large extent, a coach like me and a healer like me is constantly managing people's emotions. Um, and as part of that, I have learned over time that in my romantic relationship, I have usually chosen people that force me to manage their emotions because I'm comfortable with that. Right. I almost see myself as I'm the coach. I'm the one who can help. I, I feel comfortable and it's very familiar when I meet a woman who, uh, you know, needs emotional management. Um, I tend to be very solid in my own emotions. In fact, romantically speaking, many people will say, you don't talk about your emotions, you know, often uh, unless I'm unless I'm asked. And when I'm asked, I talk about it, but I don't volunteer it. And I'm pretty much emotionally contained within myself. Um, I've practiced that stoic philosophy. It's the stoic in me. But then how this looks is. If I'm with someone who begins to demand that, uh, you know, um, I have emotionally, I, I take on their emotions. I have to then set the standard that one, I will not engage in this romance anymore. And two, I will spot the signs and symptoms of these people uh, as uh, I'm dating, let's say, and not deal with people who need that emotional support in a sense. Likewise, if I see someone who I see uh, signs of emotional immaturity or emotional volatility or anything like that, I have to be the one to break that standard. Now, I also, though, have to look at myself and say, am I the one who's maybe a little bit too fragile or my boundaries a little bit too thick or my standards a little bit too unreasonable? Is it unreasonable for like, am I so averse to this that anytime my uh, you know, significant other or my partner has an issue. I don't want to deal with it. Now, I don't think that is me, but certainly life would prove that out over time, wouldn't it? And that's where this whole idea comes in, where it's like these boundaries, when we talk about emotional freedom, have to be flexible in a sense. And life will prove this out. So if I'm being too rigid or too judgmental or, or this kind of thing, then I will start to run into dysfunction. And I have to make the choice about how I want to be. And some of these choices are just fine. Many of my friends go, yeah, it's really interesting. You would actually rather be um, single than be in an emotionally volatile relationship, even if there's many good parts to that relationship, wouldn't you? And I go definitively 100% yes. And the reason why is because in my particular life circumstance, I'm doing a lot of that emotional stuff elsewhere. So what I need is to trust someone to show up and be emotionally stable. And obviously, one of the ways you do this, by the way, is emotionally stable and emotional. Uh, it does not mean that they don't express emotions. It just means I'm feeling this way and maybe these emotions are really strong, but I'm not going to um, gossip about it. I'm not going to take it out on you. I'm not going to make it all about your issue, but I may want to uh, discuss this with you. And when you are discussing, a discussion by its very nature it has a logical component to it. It's just, it's not just anger. It's a logical conversation that's going on while the expression of anger is in the background. Like, hey, listen, what you did or how I uh, saw that made me very angry. One, just know that that anger is about something that is from my childhood and other things. And two, I would like to have a discussion about it. And from that perspective, then it turns into something that both people get to learn from. And then this turns into a virtuous cycle of having more emotional maturity and more emotional freedom. So I hope this is use, a useful discussion for you. And I hope the takeaway for you is that when you look at these four rules, don't make assumptions about what others should do. Have expectations only for yourself. Have the conviction to be yourself and have the courage to be disliked. That this really is about you. Other people are not responsible for your wounds. 
And when you try to make them responsible by coming over the top with your emotional volatility and emotional, uh, you know, trauma and being overly emotionally, period, you have to understand that that is usually flowing from you, whether it's because you've never been able to get a handle on your emotions or perhaps that you haven't set the standards and boundaries that you need to. This is how you have emotional freedom. This is how you're able to fully feel emotions, but not live into them to such an extent that they hijack and distort and destroy all your relationships. Thanks so much for hanging out on the podcast, and I will see you at the next episode.